There we go. Um, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Wicked Fast WordPress. My name is Chris Bergnandy, and today I'm going to be sharing with you some tips, tricks, and techniques that you can use to build websites that are wicked fast. Um, and this actually dovetailed really nicely with Ethan's talk. You guys saw that. Um, uh, I'm going to be sharing a lot of links, code, um, plugins. Don't feel like you have to write everything down. Um, the slides are live on speakerdeck.com um, right now, so if you want to follow along, you can do that. Um, so if there's one link you remember today, make sure it's this one so you can get all the juicy goodness later. Um, so I know you guys all get... <laughs> yeah, sorry, part of the problem too is I have that big long Italian last name, so that is a little problematic. I'll leave this up for a few seconds. Um, so. I know you guys are all really good-looking, smart people, and you totally understand why fast websites are an important thing. Um, but there's going to come a time in your career where you're going to encounter a boss or a client who doesn't maybe get why this stuff matters, and you're going to need to make a case for why this is important. Um, so some of you may have heard this, but um, last year Google decided to deliberately throttle the speed on their site by about um, half a second, 500 milliseconds. And they found that it resulted in a 20% decrease in search traffic. I'm wondering, should I close those doors? Is it loud? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. You got it? Thank you. 20% um, decrease in search traffic. Amazon throttled their speeds by um, just one-tenth of a second, 100 milliseconds, and found a 1% loss in sales, which you may be thinking 1%, not that big a deal. If you look at their 2012 sales, that would actually result in $6.1 million in lost income. Uh, I didn't go as far back as Ethan. I was looking at the 2010 website size, which was 600 kilobytes. Uh, so you can see from 2009 to 2010, we doubled. From then to now, um, this number is apparently off. This was at the beginning of the year. It was at 1.2 megabytes. So we're now growing at a rate of about 300 kilobytes every six months. It's insane. Um, so uh, dramatic growth in websites over the last couple of years. And this used to not be a problem because computers got faster every year, right? Ethan talks about this, Moore's Law. And then this happened. All of a sudden, the devices that we're using to access the web are far more varied. A lot of times, they don't have nearly as much computing power. Bandwidth is completely unpredictable. Um, and for a lot of folks, this isn't just one way people access the web. It is the way people access the web. Um, Google and Nielsen did some research earlier this year and found that 77% of searches happen at work or at home, places where you would expect folks to already have a desktop computer. And I'm sure a lot of you can relate to this. You're comfortable, you're hanging out with your puppy or your loved one on the couch, you think of something you want to look up, and the office is all the way on the other side of the house, especially this time of year, it's cold, you're tucked under the covers, you're comfortable, so you just pull out the computer you always have with you, your phone, and you look stuff up. I don't find this number particularly surprising, that 55% of Americans accessed um, the web via mobile device in 2012. It's actually, if anything, I'm surprised at how low it is. Um, this was from a Harvard Business Review study, um, where uh, the same study, though, actually found that for um, almost a third of Americans, mobile web was the primary way they got on the web. So it wasn't just an access point, it was the primary access point. Um, Ironically, performance demands for mobile devices are higher than what people are on desktops. So if someone's visiting your site from a mobile device, they expect it to be faster, weirdly, than if they were on a high-powered desktop computer. Um, you'll lose about a third of your users if they don't see content in three seconds. And by five seconds, you've lost almost three quarters of them. And you'll hear a lot of people argue against this by saying something like, well, you know, 4G LTE is as fast as broadband Wi-Fi. And they're right. LTE is fucking awesome. I got it at the beginning of this year on my iPhone. It's amazing. It's Wi-Fi fast. Until I go into Target and I can't get a signal to save my life. Or I drive down the road, literally half a mile down the street from my house. I go from having five bars to one and I'm on an edge network and I drop phone calls. It's ridiculous. Bad storm? Eh, I still have signal, but it's, it's 3G. It's not LTE. And that's here in America where we can take for granted that we have these really fast high-powered connections and great infrastructure. In the developing world, you find that um, connections are far weaker than they are here. India passed an important milestone last year. Um, last summer, their mobile traffic surpassed desktop traffic. 
Similar thing happened in China at the end of the year. And this is happening elsewhere, too. You look at uh, Korea, their mobile search queries surpass desktop queries. What's interesting about this is you'll notice desktop search stayed the same. Mobile use is just taking off like crazy. And I think this gets back to that couch effect. You always have a computer with you, you're going to use it a lot more. This isn't just a developing nation thing, though. Um, I am the developer for Paws New England, an awesome all-breed rescue here in New England. And this summer, we found that 45% of our traffic now comes from mobile devices. And you can see how this has changed in just two years, from less than one-tenth of our traffic to now almost half of it. And I think 2014 is going to be the year that we cross that 50% threshold. About 70% of that traffic comes from iOS 7 devices, or iOS, iOS devices, rather, which isn't surprising. That's pretty keeping with um, more general outside statistics. But we also had one person come on a Nintendo DS, a few <laughs> folks on Kindles, someone on a Nintendo Wii, and a whole slew of other devices in between. Androids, um, a variety of tablets and in-betweener devices, dumb phones. There's this idea that Mobile users are busy, distracted, just consuming devices, and they're doing that. They are definitely just kind of looking at our dogs, but they're also completing adoption applications, which is crazy because they're really long. <laughs> they're making donations. Um, so for us, performance is a matter of saving dogs' lives and bringing in money we need to run our business. Um, we're at this perfect storm where we have bigger sites, weaker devices, and higher expectations around the types of things you can do on those sites and the performance. So let's talk about what you can do about it. In order to really understand how to improve the performance of your site, you first need to understand what happens when a browser pulls up a web page. So let's say you went to some URL. Clever joke. Um, <clears throat> the browser sends a request to the server where that website lives and asks, for a copy of the markup. So the server will send the HTML file, the browser starts reading it, and immediately starts rendering content on the page. Whenever it hits files like images or style sheets or JavaScript that it needs to download, um, it starts downloading them two at a time. There are two exceptions to this page. When a browser encounters a CSS, or uh, some um, styling, some mark, uh, CSS rather, it stops painting the page. Um, reason for this is pretty smart. It knows that your styles and classes and everything are going to change the way stuff looks, and browsers don't want to do more work than they have to. So they wait until they have all of the styles, and then they begin rendering again. Um, that way they only have to paint once, and they can avoid having to re-render stuff. Similarly, when it encounters a JavaScript file, it stops all other downloads. And you may think, hey, that's kind of stupid. Um, there's actually a pretty smart reason for this. JavaScript has a tendency to manipulate objects on the page quite a bit. <coughs> And the browser doesn't want to download stuff that's just going to get removed later. It wants to do as little work as possible. It's better for the browser. It's also better for the end user. And you can actually see this. If um, How many people here use developer tools in Chrome or Firefox when they're building? OK, so if you pull up the network, you can actually you know, see the waterfall um, and see how long all this stuff takes to, um, to happen. So we can use this process to our advantage to build sites that are higher performance. The easiest area to start is actually with the two little caveats to how this process works. Simply put, the order that you structure your markup in matters. Put your CSS as high up in the page as possible to avoid repaints. Um, and put your JavaScript down on the bottom so you can maximize concurrent downloads. Um, these things don't actually impact the real speed of your site. At the end of the day, these things are going to take as long to download as they're going to take. But this does improve the perceived performance. Having a page that looks the way it's going to look when it's done right up front by putting your CSS at the top makes things feel snappier. And by getting more content in front of the user faster, by maximizing these concurrent downloads, things are going to appear faster as well. Um, if you use WordPress NQ style to put your scripts on the, uh, or your style sheets on the page, they're in the header by default. Um, and if you use the NQ script, unfortunately, they are also in the header by default. But this is a really easy fix. The last argument on this function is whether or not to put it in the footer. It's false by default. Just set it to true. Um, but where most of the latency in web pages happens is really around the downloaded files. And we saw this with um, you know, just the massive growth of web pages over the last couple of years. Um, so one of the easiest ways to improve the speed of your site is simply to just have less stuff there. Fewer graphics 
um, less of these unnecessary fancy animations and overly wrought scripts. But there's a limit to what you can do with this because you still want to have an engaging website. You don't want to have just a chunk of text, a boring page. So assuming that you've already gone through the practice of removing a lot of the crap that doesn't need to be there, let's spend the rest of this time looking about some things you can do to maximize the performance of the stuff you do have on your page. Um, so there's a really interesting quirk in how websites work in that a single 300 kilobyte file is actually going to download faster than three 100 kilobyte files even though it's the same total weight. The reason for this is there's a lot of places where things can go wrong when you're downloading files. You need to do DNS lookups. It's not just that one file that's getting sent. There's HTTP headers that get sent and received on both ends. Um, possible redirects for where the content actually lives on the server. And occasionally errors because files can't be found. And these all add latency to the process. Um, so one of the easiest things you can do to get around this is by combining like files together in a process that's known as concatenation. That's just a really fancy word for putting like stuff together. Um, so you'll see this a lot, right? Because we pull a bunch of scripts from GitHub or Stack Overflow. Um, so you'll have maybe a, uh, a script for your drop-down menus, one for responsive videos, one for your modals. You should combine all this stuff into a single file, maybe a scripts.js file, and just load that as well, or instead. Um, I see the same thing happen with style sheets, too, where um, you maybe have your base styles and uh, then your stuff for tablets or for mobile devices or for desktop. And the thinking behind this is pretty smart, right? Because why should my phone have to download all these styles that only apply to a desktop browser? Unfortunately, browsers are going to download all of those files regardless of your screen size. And you may be thinking, well, that's kind of dumb. Um, the reason for this is also kind of smart. Um, there's a good chance that at some point your browser window could change. Um, Perhaps uh, you resize your browser window. Maybe you're on a mobile device, but you plug it into an external monitor. The browser doesn't want to have to wait for that additional style sheet to download in order to repaint the screen. So it downloads everything up front just in case. Now, since multiple files take longer to download than one, you might as well just put all that stuff in a single style sheet anyways. And then within that, put your media queries. So rather than having your media queries affect which style sheets get downloaded, just put all of your, um, just a single style sheet, all your media queries with it. So this is a pretty common way to structure your CSS, right? You might have a useful header for a particular section of code, um, some nice white space in between each class so that you can easily scan and read it, and each property on its own line. <coughs> Unfortunately, all of this white space adds a lot of file weight, like a lot of file weight. Um, removing it in a process known as minification can result in some dramatically smaller sites. Um, <clears throat> so this is what it looks like. It's ugly as shit. It's really hard to read. Um, but it can reduce the size of your file by 40% or more, um, which is absurd. So there's this really great tool called PageSpeed Insights. It's available for Chrome and Firefox. Maybe Internet Explorer? I don't know. I don't use that for development a lot, or just for testing. Um, but um, you can actually see it. it gives you a list of things you can do to make your page faster, and one of those happens to be minifying your CSS. Um, I apparently had some pretty, about 30% reduction for mine. I've seen sites where it results in more. Um, but the really cool thing about this is there's that see optimized content link. Yes? But when you, have, when you get the CSS like that, yeah. and then you're trying to make corrections, I will there, to there is, actually, and we're going to talk about that. Um, so you get this ugly as sin style sheet, right? It's really difficult to use. So if you ever had to make edits, thank you for the segue, this is impossible to work with. So what I do is I keep my style.css file as my human readable style sheet, and I create a new one called style.min.css, and that's where all this ugly crap gets dropped. Then, when I load my style sheet on the front end, I replace my normal call for the style sheet URL with a call for the style sheet directory instead, and then reference this, this new minified file. So the unminified version still loads on the back end and um, still has the header information in it and tells WordPress admin which theme it should use. But the people on the front end only get this nice minified version. And when you want to go make changes, you just delete the .min, make your edits, reminify it, and then switch it back over. So you can still work with this nice human readable content. You should. Yeah. 
Yeah, so you, so you would then go in and make some changes. Yes? I think she's asking for a tool that will make organize the CSS properly to a structure. Oh, um, make it pretty. I mean, one thing that you, you can do yeah. today to do the, um, the processing yeah. is like you can, like say you're using something like SAS or less, yeah. um, you can use something like run.js to uh, do the minify for you so that you just load that to make, create the new minify. You could. You can definitely do that. Um, you should also do this with your JavaScript files. Um, and I actually I understand the problem of, you know, there's sometimes stuff that's outside of your control. We'll get into that in just a second as well. Um, uh, you know, so same thing. I have my scripts.js human readable file that I can edit. Um, and then I'll create my minified version. Plugins, themes, stuff that's outside of your control makes this hard, right? Because plugins a lot of times will load outside <coughs> scripts, outside style sheets. Um, there's kind of this myth that plugins are bad for performance. It's bullshit. Poorly written plugins are bad for performance. Good plugins, not bad for performance. Fortunately, though, plugins also make this easy. Um, one of the plugins that I've fallen in love with is MinQ. There are a bunch of plugins that do this, but they basically do the heavy lifting of minifying and concatenating all your scripts and styles for you, um, as long as they're loaded the proper way using the WordPress NQ functions. Um, so if your theme doesn't do that, I, I, I can't help you there. But um, if it does, this is a fantastic plugin. It gives you a lot of control and has some really great features. Um, and you can find that on the WordPress plugin directory. Um, who here uses jQuery on their sites? Okay. Um, WordPress comes with jQuery built in. I like to use the Google hosted version instead for a couple of reasons. Um, the base version of jQuery is pretty big. The Google minified version is about 30% of the original size, which is awesome savings to begin with. Um, one of the other benefits of this, though, is a lot of folks use this technique of loading jQuery from Google. And if your browser has already downloaded jQuery from this URL, it probably has a version cached on your computer, and therefore the person doesn't even have to download it at all. They're just going to use the version they already have. So you're not just saving a couple hundred kilobytes, you're saving all of them. People don't end up having to re-download the file. Um, of course, there's a lot of places where things can go wrong in downloads, as we talked about. So what would happen if, for some reason, the Google-hosted version failed? That would suck, right? Um, HTML5 boilerplate uses this really cool technique where they try to load the one from, J uh, from Google, and if for whatever reason it's not available, they fall back to a local version. Of course, the way they do it doesn't um, work properly with WordPress, because it's not taking advantage of the WordPress NQ functions. Um, Fortunately, someone on GitHub was kind enough to um, create a plugin or a function that takes care of this, and I forked it into a plugin. Um, so it's really easy. All you have to do is just install it and turn it on. If you want to specify the version of jQuery you'd rather use, you can do so. Um, but otherwise, it just kind of takes care of everything for you. Um, one other suggestion you'll see on page speeds is to minify your HTML. Yes. It'll, it'll use the proper um, uh, registering and deregistering stuff so that if they're dependent on jQuery, they'll still work. WordPress will, it, it does it the WordPress way to avoid some of the plugin issues you might run into with not having jQuery loaded. Um, so it's basically saying, hey, jQuery, you normally use this file for jQuery, or WordPress, you normally use this file for jQuery, use this one instead. So it'll still say jQuery is loaded and your plugins will still work. Yes? Does your uh, plugin Uh, not at this time, but it could. There's another like plugin that does the same thing called use Google Libraries. Oh. That actually replaces like every library you can find. I didn't know about that. That's awesome. Sounds way cooler than this. Um, so guys, remember that down. Um, minifying your HTML has a little bit less of a result, only an eight percent reduction. It would also be maddening to try and do this, right? To go through and manually minify all of your pages and templates. Um, fortunately, there's also a plugin for that. Um, you can find it on GitHub. By the way, I, I just threw a lot of these together in the last couple of weeks, so I haven't pushed them out on the WordPress repository yet. Sorry about that. Um, for now, they're on GitHub. Um, and it spits out something, again, ugly as sin, looks like this, but at the bottom of every page, you'll get a little script or a little message that tells you um, how much file weight you saved. And it's often pretty small, but on some pages, uh, bigger pages, it can actually be pretty large. Um, so one of the biggest areas of, of weight 
on web pages today is images. And Ethan talked about this a little bit. Um, it gets challenging because we're trying to accommodate everything from big screen TVs to really tiny phones and watches. And then Google went, or um, Apple went and fucked everything up and made a, a two times density screen. Um, I saw the other day, I think it was like Samsung is working on a three times density screen. It's just, it's absurd. So let's talk about some of the things we can do to use images a little bit more wisely um, to get file size down and um, make your sites a little bit more performant. Who here has heard of or used an icon font before? Okay, so for those of you who haven't, um, it's basically like Wingdings or Webdings, but for your website. Um, it's a font file, it has a bunch of graphics instead of letters, and you embed it on your website and people download that. And you can use it to put icons and characters on your website. Um, they have a few benefits, they're really lightweight, it's a single file versus multiple image files, which as you remember is great for performance. They're stylable with CSS. Because it's a font, you can do all sorts of, whatever you can do with CSS, you can do to your icons, which is great. Um, they're also scalable, so they look great on retina and non-retina screens. You can make them as big or as small as you want. And they're compatible, you don't hear this much, they're compatible all the way back to IE5. There are a few considerations. Um, because it's a font, you can only have one color per icon. So if you're used to those nice, rich, multicolor icons, not a good fit for you. Um, also, even though Windows Phone 7 uses IE9, it doesn't support font embedding, so it doesn't work. Um, uh, this has been corrected in Windows Phone 8, but if you have Windows Phone 7 users, it's just something to keep in mind. Um, it also kind of borks a little bit in um, Opera Mini. Uh, so here's an example, right? If you had a Twitter icon, um, you would use a little bit of markup, um, just you know, giving a span, a class of icon Twitter, and then in your style sheet, um, you would embed the font, and then you can just add a bunch of stuff to this class to tell it what character to use. Um, by the way, there's a lot more you can go into than this. I have a tutorial, so don't, don't worry about remembering all this down now. Um, but if you wanted to make it bigger, you would just add a font size pattern. If you, for some reason, wanted to make it an ugly, ugly red, um, you would just change the color. Um, there is a... Uh, there's a lot to know about this. Um, there's this really great tool called IcoMoon that allows you to create your own font set. So a lot of the stuff you'll see on the web is pretty big. This tool allows you to import your own fonts, um, your own icons as SVG files, and then output something that's just the right size, no bigger, no smaller. Um, really awesome tool, it's free. Um, definitely go check it out. And if you're new to icon fonts, um, there's a tutorial I, put together, tutorial I put together that is basically a one-on-one start-to-finish guide on how to do this. Um, if you, for some reason, can't use icon fonts, um, image sprites are a really nice um, <coughs> substitute. Um, they uh, basically, let's say you had six social media icons on your site. First of all, you're being way too social. Knock that off. Um, <laughs> nobody needs this many social media accounts. But rather than having them all as individual files, you combine them into a single image file, and then um, you put them in your markup pretty much the same way, except instead of embedding a font, um, you're using the background image pro uh, property instead. Um, the nice thing about these is you're not going to run into those Windows Phone 7 Opera Mini glitches. Um, they look a little bit crappy on retina screens if you don't structure it right. Um, there's some ways around that. Um, they're also kind of a pain in the ass to maintain. Uh, but this works off that same principle, right, of one file downloads faster than many. Um, there's this really great tool called CSS Sprite Generator. I know this looks like a site that would steal your credit card number, um, <laughs> but it is actually really, really good. You just take all your individual files, zip them, upload them, and it spits out a single file for you with all the styles and markup you need to put them on your site. Um, so this is a really great tool if you need to use image sprites. So, um, one thing that we can really do better is getting smart about the image formats that we use. Um, so if you have logos or clean, simple images, PNGs are awesome. Um, but if you're going to use photos or noisy images, JPEG is often a better format and will result in a smaller file size. Um, there are also different types of JPEG formats. And the most common that you see on the web is baseline. So I'm sure a lot of you guys have seen this, right, that like top-to-down rendering of images. There's this other type that's starting to gain popularity. Um, it's actually an older file type, but people are rediscovering it with mobile, called the uh, progressive. And you can see it starts off fuzzy and then builds clearer over time. So it gets the image right in front of you and then starts loading in layers. Now, this is good for two reasons. It ends up being about the same size, 
Um, but what makes it nicer is you get the image all at once. Um, so it appears faster, even though it's not actually faster. Um, and on smaller screens, um, the image ends up looking good enough right from the outset. Um, so the fuzz is less noticeable. Um, I say browser support, because all browsers will download and display um, progressive JPEGs. However, ones that aren't properly designed for it, so IE8, Safari, Opera, and then IE9 and Firefox for background images, um, will wait until the entire image is downloaded before they display it at all. So for those folks, it's actually a worse experience than the baseline JPEG. So this is one of those your mileage may vary. Um, you need to think about your users before you choose this one um, type of thing. But it is a nice alternative. Um, similarly, you should also always compress your JPEGs. Um, I was working on a site for a photographer friend of mine a few months back. Uh, the high quality images that he wanted to use, because he's a photographer, were um, 676 kilobytes to start. After we compressed it for the web, it came in at just 92 kilobytes, which is still kind of big, but it's an 87% reduction in file size, which is huge. And this is every image in every album. It makes a big difference. Um, 70 is considered high quality for JPEG compression on the web. It's a little fuzzy for print, but for the web, it's considered high quality. WordPress default is 90, um, which results in those really giant images. Um, there's a really easy way to fix this. You can just add this to the function file in your theme. Um, unfortunately, though, those images won't be progressive JPEGs, if that's something you're interested in. And depending on how much you choose to compress, like let's say you want it to go below 70, um, they can get a little fuzzy. There's this really great plugin called Sharpen Resize <coughs> Images that will get rid of some of that fuzz and that art, those visual artifacts that happen when you compress images. But it uses the default 90, and there's no way to override it. So I took that plugin, I forked it into my own, and created an options menu where you can set your own compression level, choose whether or not you want to sharpen the images, and also choose whether or not you want to convert them to progressive JPEGs. And you can find this on GitHub as well. <coughs> Um, yes? Uh, there's something that I've used a lot called uh, Smush It. Yes. So, very popular, so, so Smush It converts them into progressive JPEGs. Um, I don't know what the compression rate on Smush It is. Um, one of the other things that um, Smush It doesn't do that I wish it did is remove um, all of the metadata for images. That is a great plugin, though. Um, I would definitely keep using it. Um, uh, it may be a little redundant with this. I'm not entirely positive. Um, if you have a bunch of images on your site already and you wanted to install that plugin and then recompress them, there's this really great plugin called Regenerate Thumbnails. Um, you just activate it and run it, and it'll recompress all of your images with your new compression settings for you. Um, speaking of smushing, um, Smush it does some stuff. The one thing it doesn't do is remove all of the metadata that you put on your images. So when it was taken, where it was taken, all of that data. Um, believe it or not, that can actually add a lot of file size. You can see here, running it through some image smusher will actually remove 25% of the file size from that file. Um, so if you're a Mac user, there's this really great product called Image Optum. Um, if you're on a PC, Yahoo has a smush it service online. They also have the plugin for WordPress, which is great to check out as well. Um, so adaptive images. Who here has heard of this technique before? Okay, a few of you. So one of the big challenges that we face is it's kind of absurd to send the same size image to a phone as what you're going to send to a, you know, a beautiful iMac display or a big screen TV, right? It, it's kind of dumb. Um, so adaptive, image, adaptive images are, um, it's a technique where you, um, the browser become, or the server rather, becomes aware of the size of the screen and serves up an appropriate sized image based on the device and its capabilities. Unfortunately, we're still very much in baby steps with this technique. There's a few HTML5 specs that are in the works to fix this. Um, there's also a few people who have created some stuff to try and get around this. So one of them is adaptive images. Um, it's a PHP technique that um, is supposed to set a cookie that measures the maximum size of your screen and then only serve images that are that size or smaller. Um, so that you know the phone isn't getting the giant, and it'll automatically resize stuff for you. Unfortunately, it works really poorly on WordPress. Um, thankfully, the fine folks at Automatic have created this awesome plugin for Jetpack called Photon. 
that basically does the same thing and requires none of the messy setup associated with adaptive images. So I would definitely check this out. Um, the, uh, the only downside to this, if you're using this for clients with sensitive information or who are weird about keeping things on other servers, um, all of the images that get served through Photon live on automatic servers um, on WordPress.com. So as long as you're cool with that, really great plugin. Um, I'm sure most of you have at one point or another zipped a file. Um, you can also do the same thing for your website in a process known as gzipping. Um, this can result in a 70% reduction in your file size. And basically what happens is the server will compress your site for you, send that over the web, and then the browser uncompresses it. And even though that sounds like a lot of extra work, it ends up being faster than just downloading your site straight up. Um, HTML5 boilerplate has some really great um, uh, code on how to do this. It goes in your HT access file, which is a little bit terrifying if you've never played with that before. Um, basically, this is your typical setup in WordPress. Um, you would add all of the stuff from that, um, uh, that bit of code right here at the bottom after the end WordPress piece. Um, and that basically tells the server, hey, you should zip all this stuff. Um, one thing that I have found is, while the instructions they provide are good for most servers, um, certain hosts, like DreamHost, for example, use a different method for gzipping. Um, so one way you can find out if this working is working is by visiting this awesome site called gzip, what the fuck? And um, you just put in your URL, and they'll tell you whether or not the site is being gzipped. And if it's not, you can do some Googling on who your host is and what their preferred approach is. Um, gzip WTF. Uh, another really great thing to do is set expire headers. This won't help people the first time they come to your site. Yes, am I, I'm up on time, aren't I? I have five minutes, perfect. Um, I'm almost done. <laughs> um, so um, basically what this does is it tells browsers, regardless of what your default time for holding onto a file is, I'm going to make some recommendations for you on how long you should keep these instead. Um, so, you know, for images, maybe a month would be a good length of time. For the actual markup, you probably don't want them to hold onto that at all because it could change. Um, but this is good for people who come back to your site a second time because now all those image files and heavier assets are already cached on their system and they don't need to um, re download them. Um, and there's some really great instructions on how to do that on GitHub as well. Again, borrowed from HTML5 boilerplate. And when I borrow, say borrowed, I mean shamelessly stolen. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, uh, so the one downside to this, if you use it for things like um, your style sheets and your scripts, is um, that if you were ever to change them, people are going to get served the old layout instead of the new one. Um, so what I like to do is I actually timestamp all of my style sheets and scripts so that um, the browser will read it as a new file and re-download it. Um, and it's a good way to get around that, um, that far future expires issue. Um, if you do use the MinQ plugin to automatically concatenate and minify stuff, it actually does this automatically by hashing the last edited date and using that as its file name. So again, really great plugin. Can't recommend it enough. Um, so we talked a little bit about this kind of stuff, but there is one additional wrinkle that happens with WordPress sites. Every single time a browser requests a file from WordPress, it takes all of those different templates in your theme and all of the data in your database and compiles it into the HTML file for you. And this happens literally every single time a browser goes to visit your page. Um, and as you can imagine, that can add some hiccups to, um, or add a little bit of latency, depending on how good your server is. If you use a, like a cheap shared hosting like I often do, it can actually add a lot of latency. And here's an example from um, Pause New England. Our adopt page was actually using um, some external APIs that were running kind of slow. And you can see how ridiculously long it's going to take to load this page because of that. Because um, we're running on inexpensive shared hosting, because we're a nonprofit and money is tight. And so at this point, we're definitely over five seconds. I've definitely lost three quarters of the people who would have wanted to have seen our dogs. This is just absolutely ridiculous. Um, fortunately, there's something you can do about it that is really, really easy, and that's pre building your site. Basically, you're telling the server every hour or half hour or whatever you want, pre compile all of my templates and content so that when people come, it's already ready, and you can just send them the file. You don't have to build it on the fly. Um, and uh, you can actually see this in action now. Here's what it looks like when we have pre-building um, enabled. So you click the link, and you get the docs. That is infinitely, infinitely faster, and it involves almost no work on your part. Download quick cache 
for WordPress. Um, there's a few others that do this. WordPress Super Cache is one of the more popular ones. Um, that one has a lot of settings and it's easy to screw up. I like this one because it's basically you turn it on and it takes care of itself. Um, one downside to that, if people leave comments on your page, um, those only get refreshed every hour so people won't see it. There's this really cool plugin called Comment Garbage Collector that will automatically rebuild just one specific page if someone leaves a comment. So if you get a lot of comments, that might be a nice thing to do. Um, and you can see what a difference this made now with pre-building the site. It loads in just 685 milliseconds, um, which is far less than a second. Um, Pingdom, by the way, really great tool to test out the page of your site. So just to recap, HTML order matters. You should combine like files together, remove white space, Use icon fonts or image sprites, whatever you can. Pick the right image format. Compress and smush your images. Use adaptive images, if you can. Photon, awesome. Um, compress your site through gzipping. Set expire headers. And if you do nothing else, I beg you, please pre-build your site. It will make such a huge difference. Um, I know we were very short on time today. I'm going to be hanging out in the happiness bar all day, so if you guys want to come by and um, ask me questions or poke holes in anything I said, I'm happy to hear about it. Um, and you can find me on gomakethings.com. <laughs>